recording live. All right, welcome back. We are WebD6201. Uh, that's client-side scripting in the winter 2022 semester at uh, Durham. And it's week 11, part one of our broadcast and time together. And uh, today we're talking about MongoDB and Mongoose, and we'll see what that is all about. Uh, so we're sitting here at week 11. Um, so in-class exercise 11 is due at the end of the week. Um, we're talking about uh, NoSQL databases and a bunch of other stuff. Next week, we're getting into authentication uh, with Mongo Express and something called Passport. So we're adding on to what we did this week. And then we're into JWT. And finally, my thoughts are probably React by week 14. But that leaves only four short weeks left for the entire semester. So that's like including this week. Not a lot of time left for us to finish off what we're doing. but uh, And lots of work to do still. So uh, one other thing to note is that next week we have a test uh, that's coming out in the early part of the week and it's due by the end of the week covering most of the, of the basic things we talked about for Node.js and a bunch of other stuff between last test and this test. So last week, what did we do? We talked about Express and what that was and how that layered on top of Node.js uh, and added additional functionality. Uh, we also talked about what middleware functions are and how that they're critical uh, to make Express work properly. We talked about the EGS view engine, and we actually talked about template engine, engines in general. And we've been working with a template engine of our own, if you think about this, from uh, you know kind of earlier in the semester when we made our own single page application on and around week eight, if I'm not wrong. And then um, we did basic routing with Express, created a little uh, a few routes, and we talked about how to render static files. Rendering static files means I want to serve them up, stuff like CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. And then we worked with the Express generator. We actually ripped it apart and put it together in our own way um, and restructured it so it works with our uh, model view controller structure. We're going to add to that this week. Uh, this week, we're going to be specifically talking about MongoDB and NoSQL databases. That's what we're talking about. CRUD operations, we're going to start this week. Uh, create, read, update, delete, both on the command line uh, directly with MongoDB, as well as with um, uh, with using Mongoose, which is an NPM module in our server JS, right, or or app.ts file. Okay, so um, MongoDB Atlas is something that I we're going to also talk about this week, as you're going to sign up for a cloud service that gives us, uh, you know, kind of MongoDB. Uh, on the you know kind of in the cloud and we're going to be able to connect that to Heroku on Friday when we get together again so that our 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 uh, cloud-based server which we've put up on Heroku is going to communicate directly with MongoDB Atlas all right so server to server and uh, do this week in class exercise 11 due on Saturday again I move those to Saturday because I figure that you need an extra day after Friday we get together in person uh, lab 4 um, again, is still due on week 14. We'll talk more about lab four if we can on Friday, if we can, if we have time. Test four, again, is open up next week, early in the week, and it'll be due by the end of the week. All right, so that is uh, what's happening this week. Any questions before we move on? All right, so what is MongoDB? Well, we kind of know what it is. Let's talk about specifically when it, with regards to MongoDB, what I want to focus on. Now, this slide deck is about 100 slides. And there's no way, guys, that I'm going to go through 100 slides line by line. It's not going to happen. I'm going to hit the highlights. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you the, the PowerPoint slide deck as a reference because I think it's good to have as reference. So things that I want to do is I, we want to need or we need to understand, you know, the NoSQL movement and how MongoDB came about just a little bit. What is Beeson? It's like JSON, right? But binary JSON. We're going to talk about that. Uh, Mon MongoDB collections and documents. What are they? Well, they're, you know, it, when we think about just from a high level, if I was going to answer that question, collections and documents are akin to something like uh, tables and records and regular databases. So they're kind of the same analogy uh, for those kind of things. Uh, MongoDB has its own query language. How does that look? Right. And um, how do we work with a MongoDB shell? There's changes coming to the MongoDB shell, by the way, 
uh, that is going to is is something in future iterations of this course. We won't be able to do it the same the same way anymore. It's interesting, but we'll talk about what this is. So, what is NoSQL? So again, um, web development has moved on, and what's happened is um, we've been using kind of some kind of SQL solution over the years, like MySQL or uh, Postgres. Uh, as an example, or it could be something like uh, SQL Server, so you know Microsoft's version. Um, either way, depending on which which version we're using, we're storing um, a lot of data right, a lot of times, and setting up a SQL Server can be pretty challenging if you're setting it up on your own. Um, we also have to use um, well things like object relational mappers or ORMs started to crop up, uh, giving us different solutions right to marshal our data. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that's, that's come up over the years, but what we've noticed is the web keeps getting larger and larger. And, um, you know, what we were trying to do is trying to figure out ways of <clears throat> simple, simple ways of connecting to databases or having a uh, persistent data store. Right. And, uh, remember that, um, as we're doing that, we want something simple like key value pairs, simple, sim, uh, similar to what we're doing with local storage and session storage. We want to be able to quickly store our data and we don't care about necessarily having a heavy duty structure, uh, like for example, something that's uh, that we store in tables and in records, right? For example, what we did with local storage and session storage this semester, we didn't really have a heavy duty structure. We had a class that was our contact class, as an example, or a user class and the contact class and the user class, what we did was we used those classes uh, to kind of structure up our data. We serialized it and sent it to, to local storage and we deserialized it and, and read it from local storage. That's all we really did. And so it was really lightweight. There wasn't really need for relationships, okay? Um, so again, um, so key value storage is what they're, you know, people were, were, were wanting. And we couldn't really do that kind of thing with um with relational databases there's a big setup like i said right so um so really what we want is they basically what we want to do is <clears throat> we want to create a hierarchical uh object representation somehow right that's what we want to do and it takes a little bit of effort for that to happen and with SQL. You have to kind of set up a class and a bunch of other things and so on. And but what we do is with documented document oriented databases like MongoDB, and that's what MongoDB is, a document oriented database that does not use a um, structured query language at all. So that's why it's a no SQL database, right? It doesn't use query language and it's document oriented because it doesn't use tables and records. It uses documents and collections. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. And um, in the same way, right, that uh, uh, NoSQL allows us to do that, we don't want heavy duty um, relationships. What we want instead is to embed documents within documents or a hierarchical document layout, right? So for example, if I have some kind of, um, if I want to post, you know, as an example, some kind of comment, right? Uh, I might have a post that I'm making, which is, you know, I'm responding to uh, somebody's video, or maybe I have a section in my website where I'm uh, giving feedback or comments or whatever, then I'm going to have, typically what we'd have is a post table, right? And we also have a comments table. And the way the structuring would work is that the post table would connect to the comments table through an external um, uh, key, right? Primary key, right? And this relationship is something that you can connect uh, both of those um, structures together. Okay, this is interesting. But it doesn't make sense for us because we don't want to do it this way. Instead, what we want to do is we want to embed our... our um, comments inside of an array. We want to have an array of comments. And then what we want to do is this, if this is our title for our post, let's say our, our first blog post, I might have one or more comments that are basically, it's an array of objects. Each object is going to have a title, right? And maybe uh, the comment detail, whatever that is, the, the comment itself, right? So this is a way that is, it makes more sense. Another thing that is a uh, kind of pushed 
uh, you know, kind of document oriented databases to be out there is, especially ones that are, uh, that have this kind of format, is that uh, there was a, a great desire around the time where, where this, where MongoDB was forming uh, to have JavaScript everywhere. We're going to talk about that in a second. So relational database is great. It's, you know, it's, it's stored in different tables and everything else. Um, but one thing is that if we store data in documents, right, in hierarchical, holistic documents, uh, it, data operations become quicker. I don't have to jump from one table to the other. And the strategies or, or sort of the, the, the structures involved in creating that data is a lot uh, slimmer, right? So um, the other thing that happens a lot is with, um, you know, structured applications that use relational databases. Sometimes what happens is the model changes. And when the model changes, um, exa example, let's say, let's suppose you're using Microsoft's entity framework with their SQL server, right? Just as an example. You make a change to your model, then what you need to do is you have to migrate to the new model. And there's a whole process of how to do that, and it's pretty massive, right? And sometimes what will happen is it takes a lot of data migration and a bunch of stuff. Not so in no NoSQL database. If I want to migrate to a new model, as long as the, the data that I already stored conf, uh, conforms to part of the model, then I can still read that data, which is kind of neat, right? So it's kind of like model changes happen a lot easier for me. And what I mean by model is, let's say, for example, I have my model is going to be the contact model that we're going to make today, right? And it has a contact uh, the, the full name, the contact number, and the email address. That's the model. But let's say, for example, in the future, I want to add some other data, or I want to break up my full name into two parts, first name and last name. Is that going to break? Is that going to be breaking changes for me? The answer is probably not, right? I can still go off. I may not even see the full name, but there might be a real easy way to pick it up. So whatever the data is out there and modify all the data in one big swoop. It's really easy, actually, to do. All right, so that is um, kind of advantages to NoSQL. And um, one thing also is we can also, um, there's a little bit of freedom when we don't need a schema. So relational databases require a schema. Uh, NoSQL databases, it's not required, okay? So if you don't want to have a schema at all, you don't even have to have a model. You can literally just uh, output pieces of data to the database. And sometimes that's all we need because we want a data store that is, is central, so, so that all users can see the same data, but there's only one piece of data. There's like one field that we want to show. Example, a to-do list. You know, it's pretty simple. We don't need a large relational database, uh, you know, to connect a to-do list. You might just have the name of the, uh, of the object, the name of the to-do, and a note, and that's it. <laughs> what is the to-do you want to do? I mean, if you really want to go crazy, you can also have a due date, Right. And if the do it to do is active or not. Right. So, again, it's a very simple one model, one schema kind of thing. It, there's, there's no need for you to relate it to anything else. It's pretty. And, and again, you or you can make it as complex as you want. But what uh, MongoDB allows you to do is, you know, create a very simple structure for persistent data. OK. Because it's a NoSQL database. So um, there's a bunch of document-oriented databases out there, but none as popular as MongoDB. The other one I would also recommend is Firebase, which is also a document-oriented database. All right, so remember MongoDB? Well, that was created way back in 2007, just before the Chrome's V8 uh, engine came out, right? And remember, Chrome's V8 engine brought, you know, the rise of Node.js in 2008, 2009 timeframe. That's when things started to happen. At the same time that was happening, so too were they thinking developers were looking for a JavaScript everywhere solution, right? And so MongoDB uh, came, you know, came about. Um, it uses a document-oriented database, and uh, it came from the word humongous, MongoDB. Um, they were thinking about how to create a scalable solution and uh, a key value uh, data store, and MongoDB fit that, right? That's how it worked. And... Um, I'm just skipping through here. So let's talk about key features of MongoDB. MongoDB uh, has BSON format, like we said, binary JSON. So what it does is for us on the front end, it uses a key value pair like storage, JSON-like storage, to create uh, objects. One thing that, uh, that uh, each document has on MongoDB is an ID field. 
This ID field you can define yourself, or if you just insert an object, it will be created for you. And the ID field that Mongo creates is broken down like this. It's hashed, uh, a random value. So it starts off with a four byte value representing the second since the Unix epoch, which is like 1970. How many seconds have elapsed since 1970? Cool. And then a three byte machine identifier, you know, specific to your machine or the server. Uh, a two byte process ID and a three byte counter starting with a random value. All right, so, so that's how it creates the object ID and it looks something that looks like this. So I insert, for example, a blog post and as soon as I insert one, it, MongoDB creates an underscore ID property or a key and the value is this random hash. It looks like a random hash, but there is a method to it, right, to, to create this thing. And it creates a unique ID, very similar to when we make things like um, commits on GitHub. Those are very similarly made, right? So uh, unique. And why do we need a unique identifier? Because we don't want them to clash with anything else. So it's not a primary key like before. It's not like a a primary auto incremented key that you might see in other uh, other databases it's not that at all okay and we don't necessarily have a cursor there's nothing like that inside of the database structure uh, where I'm looking at uh, a pointer that looks at you know one record over another record it doesn't look like that at all okay okay so I'm just gonna move forward here so key value stores is how we do it and if I want to uh, uh, normally, if I want to find data in a database using SQL, then it might look like something like this. Hey, select everything. That's what it means. Um, or, you know, the um, wildcard. Select everything from our post table. Let's suppose we have a post table where title is like, and it matches this string, Mongo, right? And this second part is uh, the filter. I'm kind of filtering the post table, so it's only returning objects that match the stuff that is mentioned here. That's how it looks. Well, on MongoDB, it looks very similar. I'm gonna say something like, hey database, I want you to look in the post collection and I want you to find all uh, documents that match this filter right here, which is basically the title uh, using a regular expression that is Mongo, okay? So that's how it works. And it'll return an array of objects. So that's how uh, Mongo works. It uses ad hoc queries just like this. So, um, so it'll return all posts that match that result. And um, here it talks about uh, index indexes or indices. And one thing we can do is we can add additional filters. For example, let's say I wanna return all uh, documents that have a comments count greater than 10, right? So then you can do something like, hey, I want to find um, you know, all documents in the post collection. Post collection, collection is like a table in the post collection that matches, uh, that have a comments count property with a value that is greater than 10. That's what GT means, greater than 10, okay? So that's how it works, that's how it looks. It's not that complex, right? And here it talks about how it does the index, the index uh, indexing and so on. Again, a little bit beyond the scope of our course, how it creates a replica set for data redundancy and uh, I'm just going to skip through this because this part is all around uh, sharding and uh, scaling and everything else that the great things about MongoDB that are awesome, but have nothing to do with us. It's here for you if you're interested in reading. Okay. Um, but when we hit MongoDB 3.0, this is where things really changed. And back in 2015, I, I would say there's two basic new er in the new era of web development. Uh, one of the milestones or hallmarks of the new era was in 20, 2008, where we had that Google V8 engine and Node.js was born, right? And then the second era, I would say, uh, happened about seven years later with 2015 when ECMAScript 6 came out or ECMAScript 2015, that new version of JavaScript. At the same time that happened, MongoDB introduced its third major version, which added a bunch of additional uh, enhancements and and it became a lot better. Uh, MongoDB is really morphed, I would say, and and uh, expanded, updated, and mutated a lot since then, uh, since those days. Uh, version five, which we're in right now, is very different from version three when this uh, when um, uh, this happened. Okay, so it added a lot of different things: better authentication and security, 
uh, better logging capabilities, better everything. Like it, they really improved it a whole bunch and as well as better speed and performance, right, in general. So the way we access MongoDB is through a shell. And there's uh, uh, the MongoDB shell, there's the command line tool that comes with MongoDB. Now this is uh, evolving and the next iteration of this course, I'm actually gonna move away from using the command line uh, to something else, right? Uh, which we're gonna talk about. But for now, it's gonna be the uh, command line for today. So before we get there, it's a good point now to install MongoDB. Let's do that. So up online, what I want you guys to do is, uh, and for those people who are watching live too, is I want you to go to this link. I'll put this both in the, uh, on YouTube as well as here in the chat. And this link here, what it is, is it allows us to download the current version of MongoDB server, community server, that you're gonna download and install for your Windows machine. Again, it has installations for other operating systems, uh, things that you wanna use. But here we're using it for Windows, all right? So please download uh, this link. What it's gonna do is, I've already installed it, but what you're gonna see is several uh, options. One thing you wanna do is do a custom installation. Okay, so please don't choose uh, the complete installation. That would be the wrong option. Okay, so you're gonna have two options. There's gonna be a uh, complete install or a custom install. You wanna do a custom install. Okay, that's the first thing. When you do a custom installation, right, then what you want to do is you're going to select, uh, there's going to be another step that says, do you want to install MongoDB as a service? It's going to be a checkbox. You're going to uncheck that. So you're not going to install MongoDB as a service. Please do not do that. Okay. And then the next option you're going to have is, do you want to install MongoDB Compass? And the answer is no. So uncheck that too. Um, if you do and you follow those instructions, then you should be pretty good to go. All right, so go ahead, please uh, do those now. Install MongoDB uh, locally on your machine. And when you're done, please check mark when you're done, when you've installed it. I'm also going to look on YouTube to make sure that you guys are done. So check mark when you're done installing. So the installer, uh, again, uh, is. It looks like this, MongoDB, Windows, right? And if I was to run it now, it wouldn't work for me because I've already installed it. It's gonna give me other options. It's gonna give me, do I want to change or repair or remove or one of those, right? Um, and like I said, what we don't want is we do not want you to run uh, MongoDB as a service. That would be incorrect. Please don't do that today. All right, and... Um, Cooper, you're good. How about Nithsen and Amin? Are you good? So you think so? Yes. Un uncheck server. Yes, that's fine. Amin, how are you doing? All right, so, so let's go to the next piece now. The one thing is that once you're done, you're not quite, not quite done. What you want to do is inside of your, on your PC, in the root of your folder, wow, I'm running out of space. In the root of your folder, what you wanna do is, is create a empty data DB folder. So in, your, in the root of your folder, so in your C drive, let's say, you wanna create an empty C colon backslash data folder slash, uh, and an empty folder inside of that called DB, like this. You're installing the server, I mean, but you don't want to install the, um, you don't want to, so you're not gonna uncheck the server. You're gonna install the server, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna move on and when it says, there's gonna be an option that says, do you wanna install the server as a service? You're gonna uncheck that, okay? Can we do that in D drive? You can, but what you have to do with, with that is, uh, Cooper, is you have to uh, configure MongoDB to look there. So there is a configuration. So MongoDB, just to let you guys know, is stored inside of program files and MongoDB, if you look at MongoDB here, under server, under 5.0, under bin, this is where everything is. And mongod.config, this is MongoDB daemon, that's what we're gonna be using in a second. The configuration file is here. We can actually open that up in anything you want. 
right? So if I want to uh, open it with Visual Studio Code, we can. Here it is. And you can see that this is the configuration, right? And it, it talks about a couple things, right? One is it binds to a particular port. So 27017, you can change the network interface if you want to. The data path is the Mongo data path object. That's what it is. And the Mongo data path object is something that you're going to have to define. So by default, it's in data DB. You can certainly define another path here. And Cooper, you'd have to do that, right? You could also define a Mongo data path object in your uh, system settings, right? So define what that is. But yes, you could definitely arrange for it to be in a different spot, but the default is data DB in your C drive. Okay. Next, let's get out of this thing because I don't want to modify the configuration at all. But that is the first thing. So your config, that is your data configuration. That is from MongoDB. And um, what we want to do now with, uh, with our MongoDB is to test it after you've installed your, um, like we said here, your data DB folder in your C drive. So in C, data DB, it should be empty in here. I have some stuff in here because I had some other data in here, but for you, it would be totally empty. Then what we want to do is we, launch, we can launch MongoDB now. And the way to do that is we're going to pull, go to my command prompt. And we're going to type in the word mongod minus minus right version. And if you get uh, something that says un you know um, unknown command or whatever anything like that right unrecognized command that means that you have to modify your um, your environment variables. Let's do the environment variable thing now because I'm sure that most of you will have that issue. So how do you do that? You go to your little uh, start button, start menu, and you type in advanced, you start typing advanced system settings, and you'll see where this little uh, button comes up, advanced system settings, that's the one you want. You pull up advanced system settings, it'll give you this little dialog box, and on the bottom right, there's an environment variables. Please click this environment variables thing. Environment variables will show you a bunch of uh, you know, kind of environment variables that have been created, right? So I've created a couple of them. One of them is the um, NVM home when I installed NVM and so on. I also have the path environment variable and there's other environment variables here as well. There's two sets of environment variables. I've talked about this before. The first set is your user. That's just for you, right? And the second set is for everybody. Right, so what I wanna do is I wanna start inside the path variable, path, uh, you know, kind of system variable inside of the, um, the users area. So double click there. You're gonna see that I have my path, C colon program files, MongoDB server 5.0 bin, right? And like I showed you before, if I look inside that, that folder, so C colon program files, right? And if I go to MongoDB, server 5.0 bin, you're going to see that those are the files I'm going to have access to. You can convert this whole thing into a address like this, right? And I can simply just highlight, copy it, and, uh, oops, I can copy it and I can go into my environment variables here, make a new space for it by double clicking and just paste it inside there with control V. Once you've done that, I've already done it, of course, once you've done that, all you have to press is OK. And then you can press OK, OK, OK. And then what you want to do is you want to close off your command prompt and relaunch it. And when you relaunch your command prompt, you should be able to do mongod minus minus version and should, you should get this 5.06, which is the version that's on today. So Cooper's good. How about Amin and Nuthusan? Are we good? If you can't get this, then you can't move on. So I got. Uh, Thumbs up from Nissan. How about I mean? Maybe he's watching. Oh, he's good too. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So very good. Thank you for that. All right. So let's move on. So now that we have this, now that we have this part, we can run Mongod. And the way to do that is just to type in Mongod. Let me just go here. Ooh, Mongod like this. Okay. Mongod will give you this like 
big response that says, look, there's a bunch of stuff that's going on, <laughs> right? And the thing that you want to see is at the bottom here where it basically says, this is the port that we're listening, uh, the listening to right here, port 27017, okay? Sometimes you have to run Mongod a couple of times for because what happens is it says, hey, look, you're you're trying to bind to all, right? You could put a switch that says dash dash bind IP 127001 to disable any warnings, all right, if you see this kind of stuff happening. So that's why I'm getting all this. So again, if we follow the instructions of what it says, we can do that. We can say something like, hey, Mongod, and then dash dash, just like it said uh, up here, right? Where it has those uh, warnings and messages. And that's like way up here when it started, right? It started kind of issuing all those, uh, all those commands, right? And it said, hey, do a dash dash bind I underscore IP and whatever the IP is that you want to bind. So, all right, so dash dash bind underscore IP and the IP address 127.0.0.1, which is your local host. And if I do that with Mongod, you're going to have uh, uh, less warnings. Okay. That's all it's going to do. It's going to just give you less warnings. But really, what it's going to do is just run uh you know this on that local host with port 27017 you can also specify the port if you want as well okay so those are the two ports and and that's how it should run now let's minimize this because we're going to need to use this this is going to be our little server running in the background just like we did with nodemon and and we've done this before with light server and a bunch of stuff we're going to run another command and we're just going to run in we're going to use mongo so mongo this is what I was talking about before. Mongo is being replaced by Mongosh, right? Mongosh is a new, uh, you know, kind of secure shell that is being, uh, that is replacing uh, MongoDB or Mo the Mongo CLI. What was the command for the port? Uh, it's dash dash bind underscore IP and then space the port, the, the, or the, for the port. I don't know for the port, it's automatic. Cooper. The port is uh, 27017, unless you, other, well, you say otherwise. You'd be fine with that. Yeah, you can. You, yeah, you'd be fine. If you just type Mongo, Ma Mongod, you're good. So what this is, this is showing you that the new, uh, you know, kind of the new shell, so MongoDB shell version 5.06, and it says, warning, Mongo shell has been superseded by Mongosh, which delivers improved usability and compatibility. The Mongo shell has been deprecated and will be removed in an upcoming release. Well, okay. And let's take a look at that. Where do you get it? Well, it tells you where to get it. It says go to uh, docsmongodb.com mongodb shell install. That's where you would go. So let's put that up there. And I'll give you that over here as well. If you wanted to follow along with this, it's not going to hurt you. I'll also put that up in the uh, YouTube channel. There it is. And um, if you were to go there, then you're going to see that, how do I install Mongod? Well, you want to go to the MongoDB Download Center, and this will take you here where you have several different downloads, right? One is the MongoDB shell, which you can certainly download. It's version 1.31. I've gone ahead and done that. I've also restarted my shell. So if I was going to try and do that, if you wanted to do that with me, you would also reinstall this. I'm just going to quit the old shell to show you that this can be. So I'm going to type in Mongosh now. And when I do that, it's going to show me a different view. That's all it is. Okay. And it's the exact same thing as Mongo, but it gives me some coloration and a bunch of other stuff. And it says that um, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff that it's missing. It needs some more configuration, but who cares? One great thing about this is if I clear the screen and if I do the same commands like show DBS, it comes up. Okay, so I'm just going to quit this because you guys don't have this right now. And I'm just going to use Mongo, right? So I can use the older one. And that's what we were talking about this week. So again, when you're using Mongo, I want to do CLS. CLS clears the screen just like any other uh, command prompt command. And then what I want to do here is I want to type in show. DBS and show DBS shows us um, all the databases that I have installed here. Notice by default, none of us have anything installed. 
I did it earlier today and I removed them so that where you can see that I have nothing just like you. You should have this view. Okay. What I want to do is I want to use a database called, we'll just call it context. All right. Context doesn't really exist right now, but remember just like JavaScript, how JavaScript works is when you use it, you create it. That's kind of the, the philosophy here as well. So I use context and what I can do is I can also show collections. So collections are tables. How many tables are in my contacts database? None. <laughs> well, because there's no contacts database. I'm just switching. I'm just going to create one now. You know what? Let's make a contacts collection in the contacts database because we only have one table that we need. Let's just do it. So we'll say DB, hey database, which is the contacts database, to the contacts collection, right? I want to find all the contacts. And again, you can see that there's no contacts in a contacts collection that's in the contacts database. It doesn't exist. Well, the way we can do that is we can add them. We can say db.contacts, that's the collection. And I want to insert, I want to insert a new contact. And the way that I want to insert contacts is they have to be inserted as a JSON object. All right, so the way it would work is open curly brace and let's use key value pairs just like we've done in the past. Here's one, full name, that's our key. And the value is Peter Parker, right? And um, I can continue by adding, sorry, but I can continue by adding more properties, more keys. So I can say uh, full name, contact number. So let's say 416-555-5555, no problem. And then finally, an email address where it's spiderman at example.com. I should really probably use mcu.com, whatever. And cur close the curly braces and then finally close the command. All right, so this is kind of a complete command. So what I'm doing is I'm sending in an object, right? This object, which is a document, is this, it includes uh, three parts to it three key value pairs, full name with the value of Peter Parker, contact net number with the value of uh, 416 and so on, and an email address with the value of Spider-Man at example.com. If I press enter here, I get a result that says write result inserted one. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. So now if I want to, I can do a db.contacts dot find and I get this ugly thing back. What I get is it's created an ID for me and it's created a random number based on that hash that we were talking about before, right? Which is, you know, the number of seconds that have elapsed since the, you know, Linux epoch and a bunch of other stuff. Okay. And uh, then here's the rest of our data. If I want to see this in a little bit nicer format, I can just type in db.contacts.find dot pretty and what this will do is it'll uh kind of show it to us in a nicer way all right this is a good place to take a pause are you with me are you guys with me on this one can you see have you inserted a contact peter parker is or something else like like you know how you like cooper says he's good i mean it's check mark and nithusen how are we doing always good too great excellent so that so i've got those three uh, this thing done. So then, okay, that's great. So I've added a contact. So that's create. I've created it with insert. This is the create. I've been able to, to read it with find. That's the find. That's the read, right? Then um, I want to do a delete. Delete's a little easier than update. And let's talk about how delete looks. Delete is a remove. So I can say something like db.contacts.remove. And I got to search for, I can't just, like if I just put this, I remove all contacts. Watch, if I just put this, it says, well, I can't do anything because you're trying to remove something and I don't know what you're removing, okay? But what if I put this? If I put remove an object that matches this, it, well, it matches everything. And so what happens is when I remove, and if I do a DB, let's do that same thing, let's clear the result. And let's do a, I'm, I can use my uh, arrow keys to arrow up. I can say, okay, let's do db.contacts.findPretty. 
Well, we see it doesn't find anything because we removed everything. Okay, that's one way of removal. Let's put it back. So if I, if I uh, you know, arrow up, I can go to the insertion again and I can reinsert our contact. There it is. And what about if I wanted to delete just that contact? So db.contacts.remove. And I want to find the one I want to remove. So I want to I want to find one by a specific uh, property, right? So let's say I want to find one with a full name that is matches Peter Parker. Okay. So what this does, right, is it I want to remove, and this part here is the filter that I'm going to use for my search. This is the query that I'm going to make. I'm going to say, hey, the first part is match this thing. I'm looking for a full name. Any contact, anything that's in my contacts uh, collection that matches this criteria, remove a re kind of re return a list of those and remove all of them. Okay, that's what it does. And if I do that again, you can see that again I removed one. And if I go back and try and show me that show me that thing, it doesn't it doesn't exist, right? Let's put it back in, and I can show it to you again, and you can see that it's back. Okay, so that's insertion and deletion. Okay. So we did remove is your delete. Okay, we did that part. How about updating? Well, updating is very similar. We still got to find the thing we want to update. So when db.contacts.update, inside here, the first, there's two parameters. The first one is the thing that I want to update. I want to find something, right? So let's suppose I want to find something that matches a full name of Peter Parker. Now you can use any of the criteria to match. Right, this is the first part. I want to find this to update. Okay, cool. Next, what am I going to do? What's the operation that I want? What do I want to update? Well, I could, if I tried to do this, and let's suppose I want to update uh, just the contact number. If I did this, and I said something like four one six five 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 zero, this is a good idea. But the problem with this is it's saying, hmm. And you got to understand what this is doing. Okay, return back. That's what this part is. Return back all of the of the documents that match this criteria. Cool. I've returned you a list of objects. That's the first part. Next, I want you to replace everything, right? And and place back a contact number with this data. So what this is going to do actually is going to remove everything from the contact and add back in this part. That's what it's going to do. And if I was to enter it, you're going to see exactly that. So when I find pretty, everything's gone except for that. <laughs> and of course, the ID, the ID stays. Well, there is no undo. It's not like you can go back and go, oops, it's gone. Let's delete it again. So there's another way to delete uh, all the values in the, uh, in the con um, in the collection, you can just go db.contacts.drop and that'll drop a, a whole collection. The entire collection is gone and there's no way back. There's no undoing. It's a destructive command. Please be careful. All right, cool. Well, let's put it back. Let's just arrow up again and insert it again. Yay, we inserted it. Cool. And what I can do then is I can display it, right? There it is. And I want to update. Let's try updating it again. So db.contacts dot update, I want to find a contact with a full name. I, by, by the way, you can search for anything you want, a full name, you can search for contact or even email address, whatever you want to search for, whatever matches, right? So I can say something like Spider-Man at example.com, right? I'm matching that particular, I have to put it in the curly braces. I have to match that criteria first. I'm looking for something that matches this criteria, whatever criteria I set. And then what do I want to do? Well, let's do a set operation. And I can pass in a curl, uh, an object for that. I want to set what? I want to set the contact number only. I want to set it to 416-555-5550. So this is modifying the entire document, just the one part. So I want to close off this one, close off the command, which is what I'm going to do, and then close off the entire, uh, you know, kind of uh, my, my method, the update method. So there's two parts really, right? The first part is a filter to return a data set. The second part is the command that I'm going to issue when I update. What kind of update am I doing? 
right? And then if I press enter, then I say that I matched one result, so I got one thing back, and I only modified one thing. You can have these different. I can return many, many things back, but I might be only, only be able to update one thing. It only depends on what you're trying to update. All right, let's do a db.find.pretty now, and we can see that the changes are only to that contact number. So contact numbers move from 5555 to 5550. Questions around this. So again, we've done now, we've completed create, read, update, and delete. Okay, pretty simple. What are your thoughts? Okay, cool, people are getting it. That's excellent. So this is the first piece. The first piece is how do I do it on my database? Well, what I wanna do is I wanna add more sample data. We need to play with some sample data. In order for us to get there, what I wanna do is let's launch our stuff from last day on Friday. Let's start with that data right now. So I'm gonna go into my desktop and I'm gonna to go to Durham and you guys are section three. And notice I have ICE 10. I'm just gonna drag that into Visual Studio Code. So this whole ICE 3 looks like my Visual Studio Code updated. I wanna drag it into, into Visual Studio Code. There it is. Right, and what I want to do, as always, is I want to I want to uh, do a git pull, right? Because I've been working remotely, and for people who work in two locations like me, right, there might be some bunch of stuff like this. It says there's a merge conflict, right? And you know what? I don't like merge conflicts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say clear. Git stash. <laughs> it says, oh, package.json and a bunch of other stuff needs a merge, right? There's nothing I can do about ICE 10. It needs a merge because I'm changing stuff. If I if so git stash didn't even work here. If I do a git pull now and it's gonna say fix up the up in the work tree, then use git add and remove, right? I could do that. Or <laughs> I could just remove the entire folder, right? That's the trick that I would probably use. So to make it easy. So I'm just gonna remove all of ICE 10, because it doesn't matter, I have it up on the cloud. Right, there we go. And then I would do a git pull. Let's see if that works, git pull. And it says, nope, it does not. So I could do a, um, and, and let me explain what happened here. So it says, it's so if I do a git status, let's do a git status here for a second. It says, you did all this. I can't do this right now, right up online. If I do this online, it'll remove ice 10. I don't want that to happen. That's the last thing I want to happen, right? So this is not a good thing, right? So yeah, that's a boo-boo and a half. How do I revert? So I want to revert back to my previous change. So that's also something we can do. So if I do git revert, if you ever have this problem, it says, which commit, which commit do I want to go back to? Okay, git status. These are all the things I have, right? Git log, look at this, git log is, um, it's giving us the head of where we are right now. So it's a, a modified structure of ICE 10, BF1808CB something or another, right? So that's where I wanna git log to. Let's do a split screen for a second here. And I can do that, I can say git revert to BF1808CBF something or another, right? And if I just start putting them this, these things there and I press enter, it's going to say reverting is not possible because you have unmerged files. So I can't even revert, right? I have unmerged files. It says hit, fix them up in the work tree and then use git add remove file as appropriate. Okay. Can I do minus minus force? Nope. So I have all this stuff happening. What do I do, guys? Well, in this case, when I mess up like this bad, <laughs> Because it's truly a mess up, and I, I I love it when we have this problem. I would honestly get clone again. That's what I would probably do, right? So because I already have things up online, I'm not worried about it. Um, I, I'm worried about uploading. That would be very bad. So I'm just gonna clone. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go to WebD6201, and just let's get out of Visual Studio Code for a second and delete this. Delete. And what I want to do instead is I know I have it up online. So this is a problem. If you have a, have a problem online, let's go to Durham Programmer. 
And notice that section three is sitting here, all nice, ready to go from updated from, from this. I want to clone it. So I'm gonna copy this address. So here's the address that I wanna clone, this one right here, copy it, right? And let's see how we're doing, right? Did we finish deleting? By the way, it might take a little bit of time to do. Yeah, we did. And what I wanna do is I wanna clone here. So inside of this folder. So I'm gonna go into my command prompt. Let's pull up another command prompt. And I'm going to say git clone, or first of all, cd space. Let's get into that folder. So that's the webd6201 folder. Let's get in there. Right? And then what I want to do is git clone, right? And then right click or get that information from our file again. I lost my, my copy right click and get that stuff that I want and press enter. So it's gonna kind of clone it in the exact same spot. It's gonna get all the files for me, nice, nice. And I didn't lose anything because here it is, here's section three. So I can just rename to section three, like we had before, nice, nice. Huh? And we should be back in business, that simple. So that's the great thing about having GitHub. And if you mess up, I messed up. And there's probably other things I can do, but here I can see ICE 10. And if I do a scan of ICE 10 now, if I do something like git status, we can say that we're good, we're on branch main. Uh, if I do git log, you can see that we have the stuff that we did uh, from last day. This is the stuff we did online last day. Awesome. And we're in line, both the origin main and the head are connected, they're synchronized. And so now we're ready to go to the next step. So if you ever have that problem, well, you can do what I did or you can be smarter than me, right? So I want to do a new folder. I want to call it ICE 11. There we go, we've surpassed that problem. And I want to go into ICE 10 and grab everything except for node modules, copy that, and bring it into ICE 11 and paste. Awesome, here's ICE 11. I want to grab ICE 11, drag it into our screen here. And now we're ready to go with ICE 11. What I want to always do with ICE 11 is do a yarn install. There's our yarn install. And it's a good practice to check out what we've got. So I'm going to go just do Nodemon. And so let's see if it actually works still. So again, I'm going to go up online and go to localhost 3000. And we should be able to see to march along from one file to the other. Nice. Excelente. So we're able to do that. Nice. So it works. And now that we've got this in ICE 11, let's make some changes. So the first change I want to go is in inside of our clients folder, inside of our data folder, I want to duplicate this users.json. So let's just um, control C, control V, make a brand new file and rename it so that it says contacts.json. I want to store some contacts so that way we get together again on, on Friday um, and if I want to upload this to uh, MongoDB Atlas, I don't have to type these things by hand by then. So let's make a new contacts array. And I don't need all of this data, just uh, up to maybe here for now. And I want to remove my username and password because there is no username and password in our contacts. We do have a display name, a contact number. Let's put that in there. So a contact number. Well, let's, okay, let's make that 416-555-5550 and an email address. And what I want to do with the contact number is let, and the name is let's match it with what we have. We have Peter Parker, right? And we also have Spider-Man at example.com. There we go. So save. So that is our first contact. Let's make copies of that. Right, and I want to make two of them. And the first one I want to change to Dr. Strange. Let's do it. so Dr. Stephen Strange. We'll use that one. We'll make that 556. We'll call this Dr. Strange. And then the last one we'll make it so it's Steve Rogers. You can add other ones if you want to for testing. Change that to one. Okay, change that to Captain America. Captain America. There we go. Okay, so that's all of them, contacts, right? And we have a contacts.json file. So why did I do this? We want to reuse this. And what I can do is if I go back to my MongoDB, so my Mongo shell, my Mongo CLI, I can do the same thing. I can do a DB 
dot contacts dot insert and I can insert well I can grab the curly braces these ones here and I can copy them I can go back over to my shell my command line and right click which pastes everything and then press enter and that adds my new contact so Dr. Strange is in if you have trouble right clicking you can always go here to the top left corner and go to edit paste which will do the same thing okay so let's do the next one. So I want to do the next one. So I want to say db.contacts.insert, right? And I want to do the same thing. I want to grab this data, copy it, and then right click and close it off the command with a paren and enter. And now if I go up and if I do a db.contacts.find.pretty, then we're going to see that we have this, uh, these contacts, which are the same contacts, uh, as an example, in the same order that I have here in my in my sample data. Okay. At this point, are you with me? Check mark if you're with me. X if you're not. Does that mean it's good? If you're saying, how's Cooper doing? Cooper, you're good? He's probably working on it. All right, well, that's good. There you go, so that, that part is okay. And that's what I've done here. I've got these uh, three contexts. Thanks, Cooper. Um, I've got these three contexts here. That's what I've got. And uh, we're good. Let's put this up on GitHub. So again, we're gonna go here and we're going to align that with GitHub. I'm just gonna make another shell. Git add dot commit minus m and we'll say added project files for ice 11 and git push okay there we go it's going to push it up online and we're good to go we're in sync awesome all right it's great so now that we have that well um we have some good test data that's what we have and let's go back to what we want to do now so now that we have the test data uh, this is okay, but let's take a look at the PowerPoint and see where we left off. So Mongo shell, just to review, we you access it by typing the word Mongo for now, right? In the in the in the future, it's going to be Mongosh. For now, it's just Mongo. Um, it launches a uh, you know connection to a server, and then what you can do is you can use the database by saying use and the name of the database. Um, you know, as an example, you can always get to the specific database by typing in the database name after uh, you launch Mongo. So you can say Mongo in the name of the database if you want to. Um, you can also do a show DBS, which show uh, DBS stands for show databases. That's what it does. And it'll show you a list. We did the insertion. We say db.posts. Well, posts is a, the collection. In our case, it was contacts, db.contacts.insert. That was the insert command that inserted a, an object or a document into the collection. That's what we did. Um, find, what it did was returned or read from the collection. That's what it does, right? And we can also do a show collections, which shows all the collections of the database that we're using. If I want to drop a collection, I can just use the drop command. So that drops the entire uh, uh, collection, which is what we covered. Basic CRUD operations, which we also did, we insert to create a new document. Okay, that's what we did there. So we inserted. We can also use an update with something called an upsert, which does very similar things, but we're not going to do it this way. Um, and when it comes to reading documents, we can use the find. If we use the find with curly braces, it finds everything either way, right? And we can find pretty, which finds uh, and then displays things in a nice way. Would we have any difference following if we used Mongosh? No difference. Zero. It's the exact same. Just a few more features. Um, db.post.find. Post is the collection. Find, but we're finding a specific user and we're using uh, or a specific document with by filtering by the user. You can filter by whatever you want, whatever you key value pair you put in here in the curly braces. Okay. And this is an important thing. You can you can use more than one criteria. If I want to search by username and by email address, you can do that too. And as long as um, it'll return um, 
all the documents that match both of those criteria, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, so again, you can also uh, have other little commands where you say, I want to find in the in all documents that match a user that has either Alice or Bob. So I can search for, uh, you know, uh, either or. And there's also other commands that you can use that allow you to do an or like this. Okay, so you can, there's lots of ways of filtering, which is really actually quite cool. Okay, so that's different ways of getting, finding data. Um, updating, we can use the update method. We talked about that before. The first argument is the selection criteria. How do I, I find that object to select, just like a selector in jQuery. The second argument is the update statement. What do I want to do? And the last argument, there's another argument that also allows you to get options, to, to add options to the, uh, to the update, the type of update that I want to do. So it could look like something like this, where I want to do update the user Alice, and I want to set the, the title of, of the document to second post, as an example. So that's the update method. I'm just going to skip over to deleting. Deleting is pretty simple. I can remove right uh, the document. Again, there's the first argument, which is the deletion criteria. So that's the selection. I want to select an object to delete. And the second argument um, tells me whether or not I want to remove multiple documents. So if I do this, we, we showed this, that it'll remove all documents, or we can use the drop method. Either one will remove all documents inside the collection. We did that. I can also remove a specific uh, document that matches a set of criteria, for example, user Alice, right? Um, so that's what we can do with removing. So that's create, read, update, and delete. And then now we're getting into something called Mongoose, and Mongoose is gonna allow us to read from the database that we just created and we're going to connect it to our Express uh, server. Let's do that now. So to get ready for this, we're gonna need some kind of connection string with the uh, uh, with our database. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about with MongoDB, right? That's installed on your server, on your computer, right? So in order for us to start there, first of all, let's do a couple things. One, in our Mongo CLI, let's quit out of this. So let's quit the Mongo CLI, number one. You can always add the Mongo CLI locally inside Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. So here in Visual Studio Code, I can always just launch Mongo, right? And Mongo will connect here as well. If you have Mongosh, you can do that here too, right? So Mongosh will connect here as well. Okay, so just letting you know. So we don't have to do it outside. If you have an error, we can always Restart. If you restart, Visual Studio Code holds its own uh, command prompts open or terminals. And if you've updated or installed MongoDB with having Visual Studio Code open, then you need to restart Visual Studio Code in order for the command prompts, the terminals that are uh, open for you in Visual Studio Code to be updated as well. But you could run Mongo, like I said, locally here, and you still have the same access that you did before, right? So all the same commands. And sometimes it's important to uh, you know, use this for debugging purposes, right? Where I can say db.collections, uh, my, sorry, my uh, contacts.find.pretty, right? Because I want to check to see that the document database here is the same as the one I'm reading here, okay? So I can definitely leave this open if I want. What I want to do though, is I want a connection string. So one of the things I need is that. And also I'm seeing that my client is here and my app.ts is here. It'd be really nice if my app.ts was in another folder and because I'm also gonna do some other configurations and that's what this is. My app.ts is really the application configuration for my server, okay? So let's make app.ts, let's put this into another, another folder. So I'm gonna make a new folder on the root. I'm gonna call this folder config. And I'm gonna take my app.ts to my app.js, these three files, and drag them into config before I transpile. Now what this does is, well, I've just lost my pathing. My pathing is all wrong now, right? Server TS might have picked it up. Picked it up. Notice that server TS is smart enough to know that uh, config, my app now is inside of config, the config folder. So this doesn't have to change. But in my app.ts, my routes are wrong. It's gotta go up a level, right? to find my routes. Why? Because I'm inside of the config folder, I gotta swim up one level and then down into my routes, right? So up one level is dot dot slash, right? 
And I got to do the same thing with my uh, views. Okay, notice that views are lowercase v. That, sh that is incorrect. It should be uppercase v. So dot dot views. And I also want to swim down in uh, up into client as well as node modules. Okay, those are the things I need to do. So views, client, node modules. And now everything is good to get, get good again, right? Why did I do this? Because again, I want to put my app inside of a config folder, which makes sense. I want to add another uh, database configuration, but first I want to say that we restructured our application and we put app inside of the config folder. Let's do that. So again, I'm going to go back into <coughs> PowerShell and notice it says uh, it's crashed. Let's restart our server. We can do that manually by RS, restart. And if there's a problem, it's going to tell us that there's a problem. So it says, um, it says that uh, dot slash app cannot find it in server dot, dot TS and JS. Why? Because I have to transpile. Uh -huh. Control shift B, transpile. And inside of our PowerShell, it's okay now after we transpiled. Yay, see, it told me I had to transpile. All right, now let's go back into uh, PowerShell again. And I wanna do a git add dot, git commit minus M, and we'll say that we uh, moved app.ts into config folder. Git push, right? So what that does is now you can read it like this. It reads this way. You say the app configuration, the application configuration, right? Okay, cool. The main or index route, that's what it is, okay? The user's route. You read from the inside out, okay? So... Wait, can I see, sorry, but you changed app with? I actually still, and I don't know what's happening, but... This one? Yeah, like uh, the dot... So all I did was... Version. Yeah, so oh, it should be like this dot oh, slash okay. config slash app because you're looking into the config and then inside the app, uh, you're looking for the app module. Makes sense, yeah. All right, so now that I've done that, I want to add another configuration file. I want to add a new file, we're going to call this db.ts, so the D database configuration file, okay. So the database configuration file, again, is um, kind of the same file, uh, you know, it's kind of the same idea with the app configuration, right? What I want to do with this is I want to say something like, okay, I want to have a URI, which is a uh, the link or the connection to my database. What's the connection to my database? What does that look like? So I'm going to de declare export const going to make a const object. It's not going to change. We're going to call it local URI, right? And we're going to make it point to mongodb colon four slash four slash. Now, normally I would put localhost, but this morning localhost failed. So I did, I did something like localhost. I'm going to show this failure here. And then the name of your, of your database, uh, which for our case is context. Okay. That's what it looked like. Okay. But we found that this was wrong. Anyways, we'll come back to this in a second. The next one is I want to export a const uh, host. Well, we can call this host name, if you will. And the host name that we're going to use is localhost. That's the name that we're going to use right now, localhost. We're also going to export const some kind of session secret, because we're going to use this in the future. And we're just going to assign a session secret that is just a random set of characters. So for us, it's going to be, I don't know, something like webd. 6201, and then we'll call it session secret. Something that's simple. Here you would really put in, uh, you know, kind of a secure hash, um, you know, that would not be the same. You would not def you would definitely align these three things: the URI, the host name, and the session secret. You get them from the environment variables if you're going to share this on Heroku. Okay, none of this would be stored here that you could read it clear text. That would be a mistake. And that's why we're putting it into our db.ts file, because we can always remove that later. All right, so now, cool. So now that we have this, these are the few things we've added. And notice what it looks like in the db.js side. It actually does exports dot, 
session secret exports dot hostname and what it's actually doing is it's it's um, configuring our exports container for the database the DB object the container for that module is going to have these properties right local URI host name and session secret cool so that is my configuration let's do that let's put that up on github so we're going to say git add dot git commit minus m and we'll say added db config file git push there we go next i want to install my um, mongoose uh, npm package mongoose and I'm just going to go to that for a second and show you what that is is an npm package that connects us nicely to mongodb it's called mongoose nice, nice, nicely actually right um, it's the most popular middleware um, you know kind of uh, package that runs with node.js connecting us to mongodb okay mongoose very interesting lots of documentation here uh, and so on so how do we install that well, it's like normal. We do a yarn install mongoose. And I mean a yarn add <laughs> mongoose. There we go. And a yarn add, I'll be okay. Package.json, what it did was it added mongoose. There it is, 6.29. And normally what we would do is also add in a yarn add at types mongoose minus minus dev but you're going to notice that it's really not required in this case let me show you why so yes it added it to the dev dependencies Woohoo! right but take a look at the, the version mongoose version here in the actual object is 6.29 for our dependencies but our dev dependencies show mongoose at 5.11.97 and <coughs> there's a reason for this because what mongoose has done if you look at node modules and if you go scroll down to mongoose, here's mongoose. It actually has a types folder. And in the types folder, you can see that it has an index.d.ts that defines mongoose in all of its entirety, which is pretty cool, right? So that is a type definition library built into the mongoose npm package, which means, oh man, does it mean that it's gonna clash with my at types definition? So if I go to at types, we have a mongoose type in here as well. and there's no types in here. In fact, there's a readme file. What does it say? It says Mongoose provides its own type definitions. You do not need types, uh, add types Mongoose installed. Yay, right? I could remove it. I'm not going to. I'm just putting it in there so you can see it, okay? Sometimes the, the you know, the more uh, modern uh, packages, they do this. And that's the way to go in the future, I think. All right, great. So that is Mongoose. We've installed it nicely. Thank you very much. And let's uh, in kind of use it inside of our uh, config, our app.ts, and let's make sure we use it properly. So the way to use Mongoose is we're going to import it like normal. We're going to say import Mongoose from Mongoose. Yeah, there we go. By the way, single quotes, double quotes. We've been using double quotes the entire time just to be consistent. I'm going to use double quotes too. Not because I need to, but because just to be consistent. <laughs> All right, cool. So Mongoose is there. What I want to do now is I want to, just before the app set and after the router definitions and everything else, after the app has been defined and before the view engine and all that kind of stuff, I want to do the DB configuration. So DB configuration. So the first thing is I want to say, I want to connect to uh, you know to the um, uh, to my database, right? And uh, what that typically looks like, if it first I want to get the I want to import. This is neat. Import everything. Import everything. That's star from my and or sorry as as means I want to create an alias db config i'm going to call it db config so db config that's what this is right um from right dot db dot slash db right is what i want 
And what this does is it says, let's just use double quotes because we've been, we've been using double quotes for everything. And here in this case, so I'm saying, hey, import everything from DB, which is this file right here, and make make DB config point to everything that you're importing. So DB config is almost like the namespace now. It's DB config dot, and you can see that if I say something like DB config dot, you can see that I get host name, local URI, and session secret, right? Because those three things I defined here. So cool. So that's how you import, and you can use this configuration uh, when we import stuff. And I want to uh, use, I want to create an alias for those things. Next, what I want to say is mongoose.connect. And when I do mongoose connect, I want to point to a URI string. Well, we know where that is, which is dbconfig.local URI, right? Yay. That's the local URI. And if I press save here, Right, an example, that's the first part. The next part is I want to create a little, I want to create a little alias for something called mongoose connection. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do. Connection. Mongoose connection, this is an alias, right? And I want to say db.on and when I have an error, I want to do some kind of function, a callback function when I have the error, right? And uh, that error, right, I want to kind of output that it's going to be a console.error that's going to say uh, connection error. So I can't connect basically. Okay, console error. I could also do a db dot once and once only fires one time where I want to open when I open a connection I want this thing to trigger I'm going to have a couple of arguments here but really again this callback function is going to be where I want to do a console dot log where I say some let's use a template string for this one where I say connection open at and again, there's there's lots of ways, uh, you know, to do this. I can say connection open at or connection, uh, you know, to MongoDB, right? Uh, connected. Let's say connected to MongoDB. Connected to MongoDB, I, at, and then we can use a template string to insert uh, the DB config dot uh, hostname. Okay. So what this will do is if we save it, and if all things go well, then in my PowerShell, we shouldn't crash. But unfortunately, there's a bit of a bug, right? And some things have changed uh, since the last time we ran this thing. And notice that it's not connecting, even though I can clearly show you that MongoDB is running, right? There is a problem connecting to MongoDB looks like it app crashed and it'll give you some weird error that looks like this. It says topology description unknown server blah blah blah, right? But if you do were to connect to it directly, let's say if I go back to db.ts and change localhost what it says here to 127.0.0.1, if I save that as an example and it reboots the server, then now we're connected. <laughs> so that was a bit of a bug we found. It's kind of slowed us down today uh, in the first session. And thank you for mu very much, guys, for helping me figure that out. It took me about, we were just like searching on all kinds of stuff to figure this out because honestly, uh, before it was like so simple and now they've changed stuff again. And this is part of the challenge of working with web technologies because they continuously change stuff. All right, cool. So that is how we can do it. That's that's showing that we're connected to the local host. Great, let's put this up on GitHub. Back to this. So we're going to say git app dot git commit minus m when it feels like it. You can see that we've added 931 files. We'll say added support for uh, MongoDB, which is what we kind of did. 
and hit push. And we're good to go. All right, so cool. So everything is working properly. Uh, we have our data file. We have Mongo. We want to be able to connect to it. And the next part is making a model, right? So we have our data. Remember? Here's our data. But I want to connect to this data with Express, and I need to be able to decode the way this is put in. And I need a model for that. Okay, so I mean, I don't have to have a, have a model, but I'm going to use one. So yeah, so how does this work? So I need a models folder. That's the first thing we're going to organize ourselves. So here's our models folder, models. And um, in our models folder, I want a new file and I want to call this the contact model. So contact.ts is what we need. So let's rename this thing. So I named it wrong, contact.ts. And the contact model, what it's going to have is I'm going to add in an import statement. I'm going to say import mongoose from mongoose. There we go. And I want to make a alias for something called a schema. A schema is really, we can get that from something called mongoose.schema. Schema is like a structure or a class. This is an alias. And uh, I can do something like I want to make a new contact schema, the contact schema or contact class, if you will. That's going to equal to a new schema. And what I want in here is I want to define the full name, which is a string. Yeah. I want to make a contact number which is a string. Notice that string is capitalized. Contact number is not a value or, or sorry, a key. And finally, contact number, or sorry, email address, which is also a string. Okay, so those are the, th the, the three properties or three fields that we're gonna have in our document. Next, what I can do is I can configure the collection. So I can do some more configuration. I can say that the collection that we want is the contacts collection. There's the contacts collection, okay? And that's our schema. That's our contact schema. Now what I wanna do, once we have the schema, and I want you to think about the schema as a class definition. That's really, really what it is. If I hover over schema, it'll show me that you create a schema. That's how you do it there. The collection, is really, it says Mongoose by default produces a, a collection name by passing the model name to the utils to collection name method. This method pure pluralizes the name and sets this option if you need a different name for your collection. So we're just keeping the collection whatever it is, right? As an example, if I hover over context schema, it says that context schema is of type mongoose.schema, right? That's what it is. And so now what we need is a model. And we can define that. We can say a model, right? is our mongoose.model and we want to it takes two parameters the first one is the friendly name for the model which is contact contact model like the contact class and the second name or the second parameter is the contact schema there's the contact schema some kind of schema or structure for the contact model right and if i hover over model now you can see that uh, model is of type mongoose.model Final step is export default model. And now we have a module that exports the uh, contact model, right? Uh, that's how you structure a model in, uh, in Express using Mongoose. Let's put this up on GitHub. So again, going back to PowerShell, oops, wrong one. I want to do git add dot, git commit minus M, and we'll say added, Contact model. Get push. And so now we have both the models folder online as well as the contact model. All right. Pretty cool. Next, what I want to do is I want to use the contact model to read from the database. How do I do that? Well, we know we do all of our operations in my index.ts. This is where I get to the links, right? This is what we normally would do. So we normally would go to our contact list and our contact list right now, if we're not logged in, will just redirect us to our login page. But this is not really true, is it? 
right? When we go to the contact list, we actually go to the contact list right now. AuthGuard doesn't really prevent us from actually going there. It just redirects us after uh, half a second to our login page, which means if I put my details in here, it's actually going to show it temporarily. Let's do that. So inside, just before my res render in my contact list, this is where I want to uh, display, you know, contacts from the database, right? So how do I do that? Well, I need to import uh, the model. So I can say something like import, and we'll call it a name. We'll give it a name, which is contact from, and then dot, dot, slash, models, slash, contact. And this will basically hold, um, if I can actually do this properly. So model contact then will be a mongoose model, right? Contact is now a mongoose model. Okay, so contact is something that I have access to inside of my routes because I've imported it. So first I create it. Here's I create it. I create the structure for how I'm going to save things and load things from the database. Nice. I use it as a module. I import it where I want it. So here's where I import it right here. And then down where I want to display it, let's use the same structure that we used in our, uh, our CLI right here. So it's going to be like this. I'm going to say, hey, contact. I want to use the contact model to find a set of contacts. And notice that there's a callback function. And the callback function comes with two parts, an error and some data. The data is a result that is of type any. So a, uh, an array of data, which is like a contact collection, or we can just simply call this contacts. All right, so the contacts are going to be returned and stored in contacts, this, this, this file right here, this uh, uh, variable. But what about if there's an error? If there's an error, then what I want to do is I want to do a console.error, and I want to say something like, you know, encountered an error reading from the database, right? And we can say plus error dot message, whatever that message is that we made. We can do a res, oops, a res dot end, which will basically crash the system. That's what we want to do. Okay, the next one is, what if we don't get an error? Then what I want to do is I do want to do a regular console log for now. And that console log is going to output the contacts to the console. So whatever contact array I'm going to get, an array of any, I'm going to output this to the console. All right, so that's what my code is. And let's see if this works. So again, up back to our local host. Here it is. If I refresh, you can see that this is still working. So let's bring this up so you can see it. Here is us reading, right? But what if I go to contact, my contact, uh, you know, kind of uh, site, and I click on the show contact list. Now, what it will do is redirect me back to login, right? Because I haven't logged in yet, right? But back here in the terminal, there's our contact it read. This is data that's coming from our database. And so we've done it. We've read from their database. We've done the initial thing I wanted to do today, which is do a read from the database, okay? And we're pretty good to go, right? Questions from, have you guys got this? Cooper says you got an error. What's the error that you got? While you're doing this, I'll put this up on, on GitHub so you can compare my code to your code. So I'm gonna say git add dot, git commit minus m, and we'll say, um, added read support or contact model, which is what we did, contact list. And that's really all I want to do today is fail to look up view error. Okay, okay, fail to look up view. Okay, that means that's a different error. Remember that thing that we had before? So that's in our server.ts. Uh, server.ts looks at our config app. And then in our, in our config app, here's our config app. It looks inside here, and you're adding uh, views to the path. 
this has to be changed. Views here, client, and node modules. Make sure that this views matches the name that's inside of your folder, which should be views, capital V. And it's then what? What and then then what are you getting? What error are you getting? Did you figure it out, Cooper? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. How about you, Nitsen? Okay. The import create error from HTTPS is highlighted. That means that um, either you have not done a yarn uh, install. So if I go back to my config app.ts and if you're getting an error with this one this first part right here that means http errors has not been installed make sure that you have a node modules folder and the way to do that if you do is make sure you issue a yarn install on the command line yarn install and again it could be a pathing issue if it worked before Check the path. So people end up like changing our our off guard completely. Is that next class? I oh guess? yeah, yeah. We have to change the auth guard because the problem with auth guard, we won't be able to do it now. We'll be doing it next week because next week we're doing authentication. Um, okay. We are somehow going without errors for ice eleven, but my MongoDB not working. Huh? That's not possible. That's not possible. I mean. If you're getting error, if you're getting data, then your MongoDB is working. Oh, like uh, I'm not getting the data, but it doesn't show me any problems. Uh, oh, that's like, a problem. The is not working. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, but are you are you running with MongoDB? Are you connected to MongoDB at all? Like uh, when I uh, started MongoDB, that's okay. But when I uh, so you got so you got all this right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is correct. Like, uh -huh. This is working. Yeah. But when I type Mongo, it says like exiting with pod one and couldn't be able to connect. Okay, so remember, in order for you to do that, you need a C. Remember that. So whenever I get that, um, if you want to type Mongo and you get nothing, is in your C, you must have a data DB folder. Do you have that? Yes? Like I didn't create it, but I'm No, sure. no, you have to create it. Yeah. If you don't have a data DB folder, then you won't have you won't be able to connect to MongoDB at all. You need to have a data DB DB folder. So make sure you make one. Right? So data and inside there an empty DB folder. Right? Like right now I have the C data and but still the Did you errors? did you add it just now or did you have it before? No, no, I uh, just right now. Okay, so restart your server. Like your MongoDB, Mongod, restart it. Okay. And then once you've restarted your server, you should be able to connect, right? And you should be able to do all those things, Mongo and everything else we did, that we did today. Without doing that, like I said, your data DB folder is required because we're not, we're, we're making Mongo not a service, okay? It's not a service. MongoDB is running uh locally on your machine and we can start it and stop it with, by using a command line like this okay now again is that the preferred way no but i know that i found a lot of people have had issues when we when we when we install it as a service um they have a lot of issues they have to reboot their machine they have to do all kinds of stuff so that's why I, i'm not doing it that way at least not for us if i was going to run this as an actual server to run yes that makes sense. I would have a box dedicated to MongoDB and that would run it that way. Awesome. So we're just kind of running the service. That's what we're doing when we uh, launch uh, Mongo. Like, yeah. Yeah, Mongo. Yeah, so that what we're doing is we're actually creating a small little server just like we did with before with uh, with Light Server. Instead of, right. we can actually run this inside of our, our Visual Studio Code to watch. So if I stop this, I want to stop this altogether. 
And then if I want to launch, um, if I go back to Mongo, Mongo doesn't detect that you're disconnected, but let's suppose I want to add that in. I can just type in Mongod and then it'll run here too. So if that makes more sense for you, or if it's easier, you can run Mongod in one, uh, you know, kind of place. And then um, Mongo will still connect to it. So you can still do a db.contacts.find. It says failed network error. Let's quit. And let's relaunch. So Mongo, there we go, reconnects. And then do a db.contacts.find.pretty. Uh-oh, that's not good. That's not a good sign. Let's do a, a show DBS. And then let's use contacts. And then we'll do that. There we go, right? So that works okay. And you can see that uh, MongoDB is here, right? And Mongo is here. Your PowerShell that's running git and git commands are here. Your watch task for tsconfig.json and your TypeScript is here. And uh, you're running NodeMon here, <laughs> right? Lots and lots of little shells running at the same time. So you got like one, two, three, four, five little terminals running right within Visual Studio Code. Now, danger, Will Robinson. Let me tell you this. Before you leave Visual Studio Code, I highly recommend, highly recommend that you drop out of Mongo and drop out of Mongo Mongod because if you drop out of Visual Studio Code, these things, these processes still may live on. All right, we don't want that. Then you'll be like, wait, I don't know how to how to kill that process. Well, yeah, it's it's a problem. So please make sure when you leave Visual Studio Code, like I'm going to do now, I'm going to uh, politely quit uh, Mongo. That's how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to politely quit Mongod. Control C, please, for that. So I get out of terminate Mongod. Okay. And once I've done that, then I can close off Visual Studio Code, like so. Well, actually. If you really want to be polite, you can also stop the watch task, right? You don't want to do the watch task anymore, and you definitely don't want to do uh, node mon, so you can stop that too. So if you stop all of those processes, now you can gracefully quit, no problem, okay? Um, questions before we go for the day. So that was our thing for today. So what we covered, just to go through it, was we talked about Mongoose, how to install it with Yarn, um, how to connect to it, how to create a little uh, configuration file. We moved our app.ts in the config folder. We have more work to do, and we're sitting, hovering around slide 85 or maybe 87 or something like that. Yeah, like around right here. Slide 87 is where we left off. And I'm going to talk about Mongoose schemas when we come back on Friday, right? So uh, slide 87, but just, as a, uh, just to recall what we're doing, Remember that ICE 11, uh, this, this in-class exercise is going to be due on Saturday again. Um, Lab 4, again, please keep an eye on that one. That's still up. If you haven't connected with your partner and joined a group for Lab 4 groups, please do so as soon as possible. You won't be able to complete Lab 4 until you do that. Test 4 is up next week, and I'll see you guys all on Friday. Any questions before we go? All right, great. I'll stop recording on YouTube and I'll take questions from the people that are here, if any. And we too. Thank you for that. And All right, any uh, questions? Are you guys good?